Good morning. The title of my message this morning is God Can Fix What We Broke. And last Sunday I shared with you that this series of messages has been uh, my way of processing uh, the unfolding events uh, in our country. That I sought to bring a biblical perspective uh, to uh, us as God's family so that we could respond to what's going on uh, in a, a biblical way so that God could uh, bless us. I also asserted that all of these uh, events are connected to things that are going on worldwide, but my interest is and always has been primarily America. <laughs> and I've omitted the fact that that is uh, selfish uh, because I'm an American. This is my home. This is where I live. And because also that I know that God has given us this country as something to be cherished and maintained. We are to be a witness to those in the world of what it means to have the blessings of God because we live in a country where we worship the one true God and our foundations were based on um, his word, his values. Well, sadly, what is going on in America today is a testimony uh, to the consequences for us having drifted so far uh, from our founding principles and um, values. Um, as a people, as a nation, we have lost focus as to uh, our roots and our identity our purpose to be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. In attempt to be welcoming of all people and a refuge for all people, we have allowed others to shape us rather than we shaping them. You see, when you accept everything, when you believe every belief or you accept every belief, you really believe in nothing. As the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, that we end up being blown about by every wind of teaching. Now, I believe that we should be a refuge for others. Certainly, the Bible is very clear that his people are to be a safe harbor uh, for the oppressed and for the needy. But some somewhere along the lines, we have lost sight of our biblical values and now we find ourselves in utter darkness and we're about to lose our freedoms. But God, don't you love those words? But God speaks to our dilemma. God has a way back. He did and still does for his people, the Jews. And he does for us today. That's why he led me, I am sure, to the Old Testament and particularly uh, to the book of Jeremiah. Because we can look at the history of Israel like a mirror and see ourselves. Because for all of our differences, in God's eyes, we are exactly the same. We have seen over the past three or four weeks that God has provided a solution for the crisis that we have created in our country. It is found in his word. It's not found anywhere else, and it's not found in any person. You know, one of the major components of the crisis that we have today is a crisis of confidence in truth. Who can you trust to tell you the truth? What is really true? There's so much intentional misinformation being published. It's out there. The only source for truth is God and his word. If someone is willing to base their thinking and their counsel on how to move forward on the word of God, that person you can trust. Listen as I read from Jeremiah chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 5 through 8. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, 
who depends on flesh for his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a bush in the wastelands. He will not see prosperity even when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree by, uh, planted by the water that sends out its roots into the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries about the year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. God told us back in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, a verse we looked at several weeks ago, that we as the people of God hold the solution for our national crisis in our choices. Because he said, if, big, big word, two little letters, but big word, if we humble ourselves, if we acknowledge our need for him, give up the pretense of self-sufficiency, if we humble ourselves, pray, and seek him, turn from our wicked ways, he will hear, forgive, and heal our nation. Our choice, God's people, our choice to hear and follow God is the solution, because God says so. It's exactly what God told his people in Judah. As sinful and rebellious as they were, God offered them a way back right up to the very end. They rejected God's way back. The question is, will we? The people rejected God's word to them through Jeremiah. They never obeyed one thing God told them to do. And they paid the consequences for their choices with the loss of their land, their nation, and their freedom. But God, and there are those words again, in his words of condemnation for these wicked, sinful, disobedient, stubborn people, and in his acts of punishment in taking them into captivity, God also spoke of restoration a gathering back into their land at some point in the future. And we've seen that gathering back uh, with, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. We've seen it in our day with the formal structure of the nation or the country of Israel in 1947 and 48. But God also spoke of a restoration that is still yet to come, hasn't happened yet. And that is that God speaks of a time when Israel uh, will become returned to fellowship with God as a nation. And that they will actually be the center of the whole world. And that is the millennial age that we see in the book of Revelation. It's a glorious picture of a God who is loving and merciful and never forgets his faithful promises that he's made to his people. But just think how long the consequences have been for Israel when they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. It's been over 2,000 years and is still counting. Well, let's look at our text. I want to read for you first from Jeremiah chapter 18, the first four verses. This is the story of the potter and the potter's wheel. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, 
shaping it as he seen as, as seemed best to him. Now, God told Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. Strange place to send a prophet, isn't it? But Jerah goes and he watches the potter working at his wheel, his potter's wheel, with a lump of clay. And he sees that the pot that he is making is not coming out right. It's uh, marred. It's flawed. So the potter takes the clay and pushes it down into a lump again on his wheel and starts anew. This time the result was good. It was successful. All through the book of Jeremiah, which is nothing but a series of sermons uh, grouped according to topic, not sequentially or chronologically, we will find vivid illustrations of how God works in the lives of people and nations, not according to their failures of the past, but bringing restoration and healing based on his mercy in response to their uh, repentance and obedience. You see, the potter had power over the clay. God has power over our sin and our failures as individuals and as nations. He can make all things new at any point in our lives or in the life of a nation. That's what his promise is to us in the new covenant. Last Sunday in our church, in church, we uh, celebrated that new covenant uh, with the Lord's table, communion. The, the new covenant comes uh, in Jesus. Now, I want to emphasize two points about this story of the potter's house. As we look at this illustration that God gave to Jeremiah, we see that it is directly applicable to us as individuals. Our sins and our failures are being marred and flawed and or, or a nation because God is the sovereign God of restoration for either and both. God's illustration to Jeremiah uh, was at first given to the people of Judah. That is true. They're, they're the original audience, as we call them. But it is a message that is important to all people of all cultures of all time because it speaks of God who is unchanging. God was sovereign over Judah. God is sovereign over us. He has a vision and a purpose for America. And his restoration for us will be in response to our repentance and willingness to obey him and his word. God offers us hope, peace, and healing, just like he did to the people of Judah. The issue is, unlike them, will we listen and obey? And by we, I mean you and me people called by God's name, as uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 calls us. So let's unpack this story of uh, Jeremiah and uh, the potter's house and see how it relates to us specifically. In verses 1 and 2, Jeremiah writes, this is the word that came to Jeremiah, him, from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will show you my message. Now, you got to know where I'm going with those two verses, right? We worship and serve a God who speaks to us. This word came to Jeremiah from God. God speaks to his children. God gave Jeremiah specific instructions where to go so that he could hear the message God had for him. God has told us where to go to hear the message he has for us. Go to his word, the Bible. Read your Bible. In verse 3, 
Jeremiah writes, So I went down to the potter's house and saw him working at the wheel. Jeremiah heard. He was sensitive to the voice of God, and he heard God, and he obeyed God. He went where he was told to go. Obedience is always the prerequisite, the requirement to hear from God, to receive his grace and his mercy. Obedience has always been, always will be the primary response desired by God. If you want to avoid captivity, if you want to uh, avoid losing our nation, we are to obey God. Now, when Jesus was here on earth, he emphasized over and over again obedience in his gospel messages. Obedience he pictured as a demonstration of our love for him in response to his love for us. Jesus says, and listen to this, Jesus says, joy comes to our life from our obedience to his commands. He ties those two things together. Joy, peace, contentment in our lives because we live obediently to him. In the first half of verse 4, chapter 18 of Jeremiah, Jeremiah writes this, but the pot that he was shaping was marred in his hands, the potter's hands. You see, we see that the vessel that the potter was messing with and trying to shape was flawed. It, it, it wasn't good. It was marred. And this is an illustration of who we are as humans. We're sinful by nature. We're broke. It doesn't matter at this point whether we're talking about individuals or a nation. The consequences are the same because we are both broken and flawed. We're not suited for God's purposes or able to receive his blessings. Some might come up with excuse because I can sense people pushing back at that and saying, well, I'm not really that bad. I'm certainly not as broken as Pastor Carey. <laughs> well, I would certainly agree with that. That may be true. But the Bible teaches us all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard, God's righteousness. No one is right before God on his own. Nobody. So we are all marred as that first pot. We're flawed because uh, it's our nature. Well, the other interesting thing I see in that is that it's not a matter of degrees. God doesn't grade, uh, as professors do on, uh, in school, and I never did, but some did, uh, on a curve. It's always pass, fail. We've all failed because we are all marred by the effects of sin. We're all flawed. It's our nature. So look at the second half of that verse. The potter pushed down the clay and re started to reform it into another pot, something that seemed best to him. And here is a picture of a relational, personal God. He is sovereign over us as the potter was sovereign over the clay. God is sovereign over all the circumstances, all the um, elements of the crisis that we face in our country and in the world. Note, however, that the clay could not uh, restore itself. The clay had to be reshapen by the potter. God wants to reshape us and make us new. We can't restore ourselves. Reformation is not restoration. Reformation is of human origin. And it, it, it never lasts. And it certainly has no eternal value. It's not that it's bad. It does, it's just not, it's not the best. Put it that way. God has already told us in the passage that we read in chapter 17, don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in humanity. Restoration, on the other hand, is a spiritual process. It is supernatural. It has eternal value. 
we need to trust and obey God. Now, we got to be honest. God's process of restoration can be painful. Because when we get ourselves into a mess, when we have been disobedient and we become flawed and broken, and we couldn't be any more broken than we are now as a nation, God often allows us to get to the right to the very edge of the precipice. And then we begin to bear the consequences of our bad choices. And then he begins his process of restoration. But his restoration is always, now hear me, always based on our willingness to be repentant, to make a choice, to turn from our wicked ways, to repent and obey him. Note at the end of verse 4, Jeremiah says that the potter formed this new pot uh, into something completely different. This illustrates God's sovereignty in restoration. He makes all things new. Now, I want to read to you the next few verses from verse 5 uh, down to verse 12, because these have significant uh, application uh, to nations. God speaking uh, to the nation Judah, uh, but it speaks to us also. Chapter 18 of Jeremiah, verse 5. Then the word, word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster that I had planned. Do you hear that? God plans disaster on nations that do evil and fail to listen to his warnings. Judah was one of those. It is very possible that we are the same. And he goes on and says, if another at another time, I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up, made large, and planted. And if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good that I had to had intended to do for it. Now, therefore, God speaking to Jeremiah, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, look, I am preparing a disaster for you and a devastating plan against you. Golly, this is the eternal God of creation telling a people that he is planning a disaster for them because of their wickedness and their refusal to listen uh, to his prophet, to his way. So turn from your evil ways, each of you, and reform your ways and your actions. God speaking to Judah, there's no doubt they were the original audience, but he is also speaking uh, to any country at any time. He's speaking to us. Now these verses are incredibly important as we see this, this whole principle. All through scripture, Old Testament and New, God is reminding the people of Judah and he's reminding us that he is sovereign over any country, all countries, and he's sovereign over any individual. Every nation that rises and falls does so due to the sovereign will of God. God is in control of everything. There is no such things as coincidences. God is able to control. He has absolute control over our current national crisis. Our fate as a people, as a nation, is not in the hands of politicians, the judiciary, bankers, 
military leaders, our fate is in the hands of God. And we will, it will come, his, our fate will come as a result of our willingness to be obedient to his word. Just as Jeremiah uh, says, and the writer to the, uh, in Chronicles chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 14, God has told us what we must do. The issue is and always has been. Will we listen? and obey, take practical, real action in response to the word of God. Let's pray. Father God, we recognize that our, as a country, uh, we are in true need. We are uh, on the edge of the precipice and we have looked into your word for several weeks that you have a way back. I pray that we will listen to your word, follow your instructions, and that in response, you will hear, forgive, and heal our land. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have a good week.